Hi guys, this is Dr. Cummings from Point Lemonazarin University. This is uh, the second video in a five-part series describing the, the fundamental biochemistry of photosynthesis. This is part two overview. And so if you skipped part one from the overview, go back and find that video and watch that because we started really, really broad in that video. We're still going to be broad, um, but we're going to start narrowing things down a little bit here, talking about the chloroplast and the spatial relationships of the different reactions in photosynthesis relative to the chloroplast. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So if you don't remember the chloroplast, now would be a good time to review that. Briefly, what we're going to need you to have kind of right in the front of your mind is going to be the stroma and the thylakoids. And in particular with the thylakoids, both the thylakoid membrane and the thylakoid spaces or lumens that are created by those membranes. So the chloroplast is, is structured very much like a bacterial cell, like what's called a gram-negative bacterial cell, where it has two membranes around it, so we call that an envelope, more than just one layer. So we've got these two membranes around it. On the inside is a fluids-filled space called the stroma. And then suspended within that, you've got this complex structure called a thylakoid. And a thylakoid is essentially one big continuous um, thylakoid membrane that, is, that forms all of these little pockets, and these stacks and pockets. And these stacks and pockets are where we find, um, we find the pigment molecules, and we find what are called the photosystems, the uh, structures involved in creating, ultimately, um, uh, the, the power for the light reactions and the dark reactions. So what I want you guys to do is make sure that you're comfortable with the concept of the, the basic structure of a chloroplast, and in particular, make sure that we can talk about the thylakoid and break that down to the thylakoid membrane and the thylakoid lumen, as well as the stroma that is uh, suspending that. If you want to compare this to a mitochondrion, it's very similar, except there's a third membrane here, whereas mitochondria only have two. The stroma would be analogous to the matrix of the mitochondria. So keep that in mind. Now, of course, we're thinking when we think about a chloroplast, we're thinking about eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms. If these were um, blue-green algae, which is a fancy word for photosynthetic bacteria or cyanobacteria, the entire chloroplast here would essentially be one cell of the gram-negative bacteria. You'd have an outer membrane called an LPS layer, an inner cytoplasmic membrane. Um, what we call in the chloroplast the stroma would actually be the cytoplasm of the cell. And then you'd have a complex thylakoid uh, inside of that. And so we're going to focus on the chloroplast and therefore the eukaryotic version of photosynthesis, but very, very similar in the prokaryotes as well. So let's go ahead and zoom in on a chloroplast. What you've got here in the upper left is kind of a basic diagram of a plant cell. You can see it's got sort of its traditional boxy shape to it with thick cell walls. Inside it, you can see they've cut into a nucleus. Um, there's a large central vacuole to give it some shape and structure. You can see all the endoplasmic reticulum membranes, the Golgi membranes. You can even see mitochondria. That's important because the, the ATP that's produced by what we call photophosphorylation here in the, the, um, in the, the chloroplast is not available for the rest of the plant's energy needs. And so plants, even though they photosynthesize, do also respire. So they have to go through cell respiration to create ATP that they can use for all of their high energy needs throughout. Um, so you're going to find mitochondria in all your plant cells. And in the ones that photosynthesize, you're also going to find these pigmented structures called chloroplasts. So here's your double membrane that we call an envelope. This light blue represents the stroma of the chloroplast, right? The, the, the space, the liquid-filled space, that's going to be important. And then we're going to zoom in on one stack of these thylakoids. They've colored them green to show that this is where the pigments are taking place. And we're going to see that a set of reactions that are light-dependent take place here. And so we call those the light reactions. And so the light will penetrate all the way through all the material of the cell until it actually hits the thylakoids and the surfaces of, the, of the, the thylakoids. So if you look at a plant, if you can look outside right now, if you can look at a house plant right now, the green that you're seeing is actually light being reflected specifically 
off of pigments in the thylakoid membranes of those leaves of the plants. And so the light is penetrating all the way through the cells. Uh, most of it is bouncing back off. Some is being absorbed. Uh, and as long as water is available, then the cell is going to be able to use that light energy through a set of really complex reactions to generate two critical high energy molecules, ATP. We know what that's all about. And then a high energy electron carrier called NADPH, phosphorylated version of NADH. So we know there's an NADP plus. That is the oxidized form. NADPH is going to be the reduced form. The purpose of the light reactions is to take light energy and generate chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH to produce that in the stroma of the chloroplast to be available for the actual production of organic matter. In these light reactions, a waste product is produced, that's oxygen. And that oxygen, because it's small and hydrophobic, is going to diffuse right across the membranes following its gradient, and it's going to be released into the atmosphere. Thank God, right? We all, we all need that. Now, the, so the first set is the light reactions producing ATP and NADPH. These are the high energy intermediates that drive what's called the dark reactions or, or the Calvin cycle, where carbon dioxide, let me move this over, carbon dioxide is fixed. Carbon fixation simply means taking oxidized inorganic carbon and reducing it electronically and um, combining it. So we reduce it, we combine it, and it takes power in the form of ATP and NADPH, which of course get recycled to ADP, inorganic phosphate, and NADP+, which are all required for the light reactions. And that CO2 then gets combined into a sugar such as C6H12O6 glucose, which can then be exported from the chloroplast and used by the plant cell and by the rest of the plant for all of its biosynthesis needs, as well as some of its, its uh, cell respiration needs, because it does actually need to respire, as we said earlier. So I want you to, to really focus on this figure here. I'll try to get my picture out of the way here. This figure here as a touch point. Come back to this figure often as you're learning these processes, because this is the, the big picture of what's taking place in the chloroplast, and we're going to be zooming down in on nitty-gritty chemical reactions, biochemical reactions. And you need to keep in mind where these reactions are taking place and what the goal is for each of these steps. So the last thing I want you to do before you finish this video, or before really you move on to video number three in this series, is to take a few minutes and define some key abbreviations. RUBP, we're going to be using that frequently as we talk about this. Related to RUBP is an enzyme called Rubisco. Rubisco, you're going to see, is believed to be the most abundant protein, possibly the most abundant molecule, except for maybe cellulose, on the entire planet. This is a really important enzyme. What does Rubisco stand for? What does it do? Hopefully we know what ATP is. Remind yourself if you need to. NADP+, plus, what's its role? What, is it all, what do these, these letters stand for? And then a new sugar called G3P. What is G3P? Where does it fit into the whole picture? All right. Hopefully, these first two overview videos have really prepared you now for us to dive into the nitty-gritty biochemical reactions that are taking place. And we're going to start on those with uh, what we're called the, the non-cyclic electron flow reactions of the light reactions. That's the next video. Make sure you're ready for that before you jump in. See you shortly.